Rebecca Jernigan, your tour guide into discoveries, coming to you live from the heart of America to around the globe via the World Wide Web, satellite, and podcast. Let's journey together into the realms of the known to the unknown in search of enlightenment, knowledge, and truth. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful planet Earth. Tonight I have a really wonderful return guest for you. We'll get to him in just a moment. For right now, I do have a couple of announcements. As you all know, we donate our time and our resources to bring you all the guests and some of the most informative, helpful, and knowledgeable information found out found on the net and all around. So donations are always welcome and we appreciate every dollar you can donate. So thanks to all of you for your generosity for Project Camelot TV and Journeys with Rebecca. And don't forget to hit the donate buttons on both of those websites if you can possibly afford it. Now the second announcement I have is I have a date set in November uh, for my past life timeline integration class. I've had a lot of requests to schedule one. So on my site, that's journeyswithrebecca.com, uh, under the classes link, and there on the front page, you'll find all the needed information on the class, the time, all of the um, information that is needed to decide whether this would be something you'd want to do or not. So if you are interested, you can follow the directions that are there, and I will confirm the class once the minimum number of people have been met through email that you use when you follow the directions. Again, that's journeyswithrebecca.com. I thank you for that. And there is also where you can uh, log on to get my free newsletter that I send out uh, when I have uh, guests or classes scheduled or any updates. Um, speaking of classes and updates, I do have another show coming up on Thursday with Nick Redfern. And again in November, I have a follow-up show uh, with Mr. Jim Mars on population control. Uh, we'll be bringing him back. And I have a couple of more guests that I will be scheduling very soon uh, to bring in to the end of this year, 2016. So don't forget to go there and sign up for the free newsletter and also join me on Twitter. Okay. Now, all of that being said, on to my guest for tonight. Mr. Craig Campobasso is with me. And if you watch the last shows that we did a, a few weeks ago, then you'll be familiar with Craig and his work. And if not, you're really in for a treat with this wonderful and really most interesting man. Welcome to the show, Craig. Hey, how are you guys? Yeah, everyone here is doing <laughs> well. We hope everyone out there is doing just as good as we are. Yes. Hey. Hello to the listening audience as well. Absolutely. And we want to say thank you to Brian, too, um, our engineer and producer for the show. Uh, he's always a, a great resource, and he's just absolutely fabulous in, his, in what he does for us in order to bring um, all of the guests and Craig and I and into your house so that you can listen to us tonight. So how fabulous is that? That's great. And he also made popcorn. He did. He did. And I'm telling you, it's delicious. <laughs> but we can't eat it. We can't get to it. <laughs> he tells me it's delicious. <laughs> so let me let me give everyone a little background here on you, Craig. Um, you sure. have been a guest on my show off and on for quite a few years now. I don't even know how long it's been, to tell you the truth, but it seems like a long, long time. It's only because yeah. I know you from way long ago before we arrived here. And we'll get yeah. into that topic a little bit later. Um, but the last time you were here, you talked. We, we, we got everyone caught up on the third book of the trilogy of I Am Tehran Saga. Um, and we wanted, I wanted to, for those that may be just tuning in for the first time to your show, uh, you know, to listening to you, I'd like for you maybe to start out and give a quick synopsis of the three books because you have the fourth one coming up which uh, you'll have to announce that, as well as some of the goodies and things that are available to anyone uh, in regards to the books as well. So I'm going to leave it to you. Uh, well, it, it's very funny because I've, I've gotten a lot of really nice emails because uh, people have been waiting for the third book for a long time. And, and, uh, and they were very excited that there's going to be a fourth book, but they said, you do know what a trilogy is, don't you? <laughs> 
<laughs> I said, yes, but we're going to continue it. So anyway, so the, the whole series is called The Autobiography of an Extraterrestrial Saga. Each book is subtitled. Um, it's about uh, Solar Commander Tehran, who is a part of the Galactarian alignment of space peoples and planets and he's also a part of its subdivision which is called the star seed alignment of space peoples and planets uh book one starts us off uh showing us that he is a um professor at the university of melchizedek uh part of uh what he teaches is uh, to messengers and mighty messengers who are going into um, incarnation missions on younger planets to help raise consciousness. So we learn about that there, but then we learn one, one interesting um, uh, thing about Tehran is that Tehran lives in a, of course, in a society that is fully conscious. But Tehran was born dualistic. And in, in universal society, in about one in every 200,000 babies born, they're, they're born dualistic. And, uh, and it's for several reasons. Uh, because the, the universal society is not used to living with dualistic people, um, it helps keep them... Uh, uh, humble to the expressions of what a dualistic person thinks like. Uh, uh, the, the, the difference between right and wrong and making, uh, and making choices and making bad choices or uh, uh, all different types of things that we all go through here on the planet. Uh, I don't need to go into detail. We, we've all lived them. Uh, anyway, <laughs> we could all write, you know, a volume on that. Uh, anyway, so when, when he was a teenager, he went away to a boarding school where he met uh, other dualistically minded uh, people, and uh, two of them remained his uh, great friends all the way uh, throughout the trilogy. So... Anyway, so what we do is we go on Tehran's journey of not only why was he chosen to, to teach at Melchizedek, uh, but learning why he's dualistic and how he overcomes his own duality. So we, the reader of the books, actually become the character of Tehran and go on this journey to learn how he rises up and out of duality throughout the trilogy, and uh, and what happens when he becomes fully conscious, and in training those who are coming here, who are fully conscious there, who then will incarnate here on their incarnation missions, and they'll be dualistic, and then at some point they'll have a major spiritual awakening and start to raise consciousness. But we'll get into that much later in the show. So that sort of takes us on the journey, but then we have the greater duality of the universe uh, between Archangel Michael and Lucifer, and we actually um, go through that entire storyline from uh, book one all the way through book three, and uh, that, that drama uh, ends in book three, um, which is uh, that book I, I really, really was uh, waiting to write because it's where Lucifer um, and uh, all his cohorts go on a trial for soul death. Um, they've already been in prison for 200,000 years and have been given many times and chances for redemption. Um, and it's what happens during this trial, and we go back and forth to the original trials um, that, that happened um, 
uh, when uh, the, the ones that put him and his cohorts in imprisonment uh, over 200,000 years ago. So needless to say, they're created beings, so they, they don't die unless they go into soul death and what that process is like, uh, et cetera, is all in book three. So book three is quite a um, moving tearjerker, I, I would say. I, I, in writing it, went through... Uh, I probably cried every day when I wrote it. So, um, but yeah, it's it's just uh, it's it's just an amazing end to the story and what ends up happening with that story and Tehran's story is not even what I could have fathomed. So, as we all know, characters write themselves, and uh, these characters definitely wrote themselves, and. Um, so, so that's the journey um, of the three books. Book two is the largest of all of the books. It's almost 500 pages. Um, and, and that we sort of get into um, uh, other, other things that are going on in the universe uh, with a war with a planet called Bruba and who those beings are and... Um, and why why this why they're warring uh against the alignment and uh, all of that but what we get to learn are the unbelievable spiritual space technologies of the galactarian alignment of space peoples and planets which is um all based on harmonics and all based on um uh, not a life is lost and how that happens is quite amazing so well i have to tell you i read all three of the books yeah. and and um first of all book one really opens your mind and it allows you to step into and transform your your environment into a world of different sensations colors textures understandings um, book two uh, cements book one and then opens the door for book three and then you know it's like it's like uh, it's almost like reading a mystery novel what happens next you know what's next right. what's next it moves very fast very quickly um, but yet it's very engaging um, it's it's a it really, uh, they're beautiful books. They're wonderfully written. Um, I really, really enjoyed them. I, I really did. I really, really enjoyed them. Uh, thank you. And um, one of the things that I, I know that you are doing on your websites is if, if people are interested in the books, that you have some special offers, and we can get into that later. We can do it now, whatever your case may be. But one of the things that I wanted to make sure that you uh, will talk about and you can share is that that this this the whole story was really based on information that you received about who Tehran is? Yes, yes. When uh, the capsulated version of that is when I was 26 years old, um, I had a major spiritual awakening with Universal Master Teachers and. It continued and continued and continued, and a big part of that was opening up to the um, to the doors and the love and the expression of the universe and connecting in with that oneness and then uh, I went through uh, a period the these teachers um, one night fed me with this golden light that is so of the beauty and, and the harnessing of love that you can't ex explain it unless you've experienced it. Um, I guess you would say if your mother and father really loved you, if you amplified that, by a hundred million times, you might that might be what the feeling is, um, and it's it's so overwhelming that you literally go into a b blissful weeping, 
because it's so beautiful that that your body just reacts to it. So so I all of the cells in my body were awoken to uh previous uh memories um about the universe about uh uh these beings Tehran being one of them um along with master teachers that came from the great I am as well and their world is um uh one of the fir- is the first world created in the first um in the first universe in the first super universe there's seven super universes and then we're uh, and they're in the first super universe we're in super universe 7 so um anyway uh it's it became um it was about um an eight eight month period where Every day, all I did was see the beauty behind the creation of everything, and I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. But they were beautiful sobs. And um, and really what it was was sort of like a cleansing process as well. Um, and I started working through things and seeing things differently and understanding my own behaviors how I was reacting to emotions and that um, I didn't need to react to them anymore. So I started working on myself and working on myself and working on myself. And I'm still working on myself. We all still work on ourselves. Uh, yeah, it's a work in progress, yeah, right? It, it's always going to be a work in progress. Yeah. And so I can say that, yes, I've gotten better. And, yes, I've, uh, uh, I've, you know, I've, I myself am very proud of uh, where I'm at. I don't always succeed. Some days are a little more challenging than others, but I but I'm I I recognize and put out the effort um to do that. And I work in the film industry by the way, and every producer and director looks at me and says, "We are in the middle of chaos. How can you be so calm?" And I say, because if I get angry and upset and scream and yell, what good is that going to do? So let's just deal with what we're doing at hand and let's move through it quickly and hear solutions. And, and that's how we move through it. So, um, but anyway, that whole process for me was... Uh, extremely beautiful, and there there was a major awakening process that continued, uh, which then I wrote about in a 400-page book. Um, and then one of the main uh, teachers said, "What would you say if uh, I told you you just wrote that book for yourself?" And I said, "Then I would say I learned an awful lot about myself." Um, and that's right after I had just visited Mount Shasta and had a major experience with the Great I Am, where, where it um, uh, split my astral form in two and uh, spoke. And and that is actually in book two, um, that whole experience. Um, but so when I when I returned, this is one of the master teachers from that world. And I said, then I've learned a lot about myself. And and he said, now it's time to sit down and write the real book. We don't want you to um, stop, change, or modify anything. You are to con- just continually write everything that you hear. And as it comes out, um, don't edit. Don't do anything until we stop the flow. So what it would be like is they would wake me up at 3 a.m. every morning. They said this was the best time to write because all the brain waves were low. And I would sense all of their energy forms um, in the room where my body would ring with chills for 10 to 15 minutes because I I wasn't adapted to it then. and then I would just start writing. So really, book one and book two were a book that was 900 pages. So that I wrote over many, many years. And then when it came time to do it, is then I cut them in two and cut them down. And then 
uh, and then uh, over a year ago wrote uh, book three. So, so that was the process for me, which still continues to this day because I know when I don't understand something that I write that it's going to be explained later on. And you and I say, you know, that's why when you read the books, there's so many mysteries and twists and turns, which I know that a lot of the readers really, really like because it keeps them moving yeah, uh, for throughout sure. the book. Too. Yeah, because you really want to know what that information is. So, so um, uh, it's kind of like I think one one uh, reader wrote, I feel like I'm kind of watching, uh, I'm kind of reading. Dynasty in the Cosmos. <laughs> I said it's a little like that, you could say, <laughs> because they were it's cliffhangers, you know, oh, sure. all those shows like Dynasty in Dallas had major cliffhangers. So, so there's a lot of cliffhangers to keep people, uh, you know, uh, wanting wanting more. So, well, it definitely um, it definitely held the people's attention. I'll tell you, and if it doesn't, I don't know what would, because that it really was. It was, uh, it was a challenge for me uh, to not just keep my nose stuck in the book. You know, you have to get up. And you go. Oh, I don't want to leave this because I, you know, can't wait to turn the page. Seriously, it was really great. Yeah, yeah. Most people um, who have uh, wrote to me read it in one night or in two sittings. Yeah. And what I found in book three, um, a lot of them write and say, uh, because they've written me, they wrote me first and said, when is book four coming out? And I said, I have no idea. It's not going to be right away. And they said, so what they're doing is they're spacing it out, and it's like killing them because they don't want it to end. So they're like doing a chapter a week or something like that to sort of spread it out. And I said, well, that's good. That works, too. So, but I said you could read it really, you know, you you can read this and then go back and reread it again slowly and you'll pick up so many more nuances. Oh, sure. Uh, that that you didn't know. It would just with any book. Sometimes I go back and read reread book 1 um, cuz I go back and reread the books that are already published before I write the next one. Uh, and I myself go, "Wow." Yeah, I just got something even more than what I originally got way back when. So everything has layers and levels to it, and everything they do. And so you can read something once and go back and read it again, and it'll have way more depth for you and right and enhance yes, the meanings yes. and the understanding. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, and the um, and uh, on the like you said before on the website. We have a super fan special. Uh, if anybody hasn't read the books, you can get all three soft covers or all three hard covers, which I will autograph. And you, you get uh, some extra goodies for that: Tehran and Kyalina wristbands, and the Universal Seal of Protection uh, postcard, and a kitchen magnet. And uh, anybody who buys a book on the website that I autograph, we also give them a code to get in. Uh, to a secret part of the website that has all the main characters' photos and color and their biography. And that's very is, cool stuff. Yeah, it's really, really cool. So, so that's really fun. And the website's autobiography of an A-N-E-T dot com. So, uh, and, and a lot of times I just type my name and it'll pop up into Google. Yeah, you're, so. you're all over Google, hon. Huh? All over Google. You're all over the Google thing, yeah. I sure? know, I'm, I'm, I'm the Google. Y yep, you're the Google. <laughs> it's all good. So, okay, so we, we, you, you had all these wonderful experiences. I mean, um, you, you, you were reawakened or yeah, reawakened is a, is appropriate term yeah. here to to what your life was like off world. And you know, before I forget, I'm going to back up a little bit, so I'm I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. You mentioned yeah. this in the last show about the seven super universes that were created, and right. I find that interesting because you are only the second person that I've ever spoken to in all the years that talk about the seven 
planes of existence or the seven whatever they've called it you call it the super universes and my guides have called it the seven worlds uh not meaning one planet but right meaning a universe um meaning you know uh this and they have they talked to me that they call it the story of creation um, yes. And they gave me that information many, many years ago. I, I really regret that I was not able to to write that information down. I'm just a writer. I'm not. I mean, I, I, I'm an okay orator, but I'm, I just, just, it loses something. Even when I try to, you know, do the automatic writing or channeling in writing, I still lose a lot of the context and content uh, in the written form. I'm just just not real good with it. Um, and I, I regret that. I regret that I wasn't able to, to pull that, that out of me uh, because there's probably 20 books in me with all the information that I've been given through the years. Yeah. But the yeah. seven worlds, uh, or as you call them, the seven super universes, were explained to me in such a way that it became so in-depth and so beyond... Um, human you know our 3d human understanding conceptually i got it to a to a point right. um, but it gets so deep and so interesting and so strange i mean there's stuff that i have seen that i just don't even have a correlation to there's no way that i can even begin to to talk about it because i don't have a point of reference even nothing that even comes close to what i've saw what they've shown me you know where i've been it's just it's been amazing it really has been amazing so at some point i'd like to just get with you you know uh off camera here as they say or off mic and talk to you about that and and, and maybe sure. shop, shop swap some stories and see see how much they line up because uh it's always been you know just this very interesting story and they keep talking to me about it even even today even after all these years uh, they keep talking to me about it, so it's kind of fascinating. Anyway, well, just to give you just a tiny uh, little uh, tidbit is Tehran is a soul split of seven. He has a um, he he has another uh, another uh, uh, what's the right word um, another soul who is him in each of the super universes mm -hmm. and we learn a little bit of this in book one there's a little bit of teasing about learning more in book two and then in book three we meet his seven selves and we understand why he is connected to his seven selves within each of the super universes now the, the thing is is if you are uh, so he is called an, an eternal final eater. And what that means is he is living in seven different existences, his soul, his oversoul, in each of the super universes. So there he's having these different experiences in the different ones, but he, most souls here are called final eaters. So they, they travel towards paradise, and they will then go through all of the, the, um, uh, the concentric spheres there once they reach paradise and go living on from world to world to world to world, which is you can't even, you can't even fathom the depth and the beauty and all of that, and there's no more duality, there's no right. more any of that. It's just pure bliss. But an eternal final eater is having that experience in all of the super universes. So if you are getting a glimpse into that and feeling that, then you're probably having that same experience. Because remember, we're all souls. Um, we're all we're basically all the same souls. But some of us are choosing to have different experiences, right? And some of us, um, some some of us w want to expand that, or if we want to do more universe, super universe, and multi super universe work to advance 
our our soul in the universe is universe is then we go on and we do this multiple layered type of work as we're integrating into all of that consciously. So I hope that sort of said it. I hope that made sense. It did to um, me. I, I'm not sure it did okay. to everyone, but you know, it's it. it right. The message got delivered to um, to those that it got delivered yeah. to. So. Yeah, all right, uh, it's all good, right? It's all good. <laughs> it really is. Yeah, my little brain's on fire now. Thank you. Um, yeah, you're yeah, welcome. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my brain's been on fire since I was 26. Yeah, there you go. It's like it stays on fire, right? Um, so it. let's let's move into, uh, because we're talking about super universes and multi-universes and et cetera and so forth. Let's, let's, let's bring some of that a little closer to home and I, I want to talk about the ET connection, extraterrestrial connection that is here on this planet and has been here on this planet. Um, you were on a few years ago and, and talked about um, at that time the stranger at the Pentagon and right. um, when before we started the show tonight you uh, said that you might want to get into a little bit more of the backstory behind the uh, person that we, the ET, the extraterrestrial, the entity, the being known to us as Valiant Thor. Um, right. There has been uh, recently, and not from your camp, by the way, I might add, which I, I find really cool, uh, is some pictures over the last few, oh, I would say last few months, uh, showing uh, these particular people are very interested in uh, who all has documented, um, they've documented uh, extraterrestrial visitations here on the planet. And right. there's been pictures and some documentation, they've shown documents. And one of them uh, spent a few of them, a uh, few pictures of them with a little bit of a description on Valiant Thor. Uh, the reason I know it doesn't come from you is the way it was written and um, and, and the write-up itself, it was very positive. It wasn't a negative thing. Um, and, right. and they tied it in very nicely with, with the rest of their information. So this is somebody that's done their research and is continuing to do their research. I do hope they're listening to this show tonight because I think it'll be fun for them. Um, anyway, um, but there's a, there's a story there. There's a lot of information there that you've not been able to share or due to time constraints. Uh, about Valiant Thor and some of the other information that you have all around that and before, or prior to that, et cetera, and so forth. So I'd love for you to get into that a little bit tonight. Sure, absolutely. Uh, I I read the book Stranger at the Pentagon in the 80s. Um, I was really quite fascinated with it, taken with it. The photographs of Valiant Thor in the actual book, which were taken by August C. Roberts, who is a, was a retired Air Force photographer and a ufologist, was at the Menger Farm where Valiant Thor, his vice commander Don, and another vice commander whose name is Zan on board Victor One, which is Valiant Thor's flagship, that that holds 200 people his wife whose name was jill is the blonde woman in those original photographs right now there was also a a, a ufologist named jim mosley who uh who was pretty much a debunker of a bunch of things but Jim Mosley is actually also in those photographs as a young man of 19 years old, and he was there that day as well. Now, I met Jim through Dr. Frank. I also met um, uh, Connie Menger through Dr. Frank, uh, and it was at Howard and Connie's uh, backyard where those photos were taken. So... I got to talk to Connie at length about it, and she she told me that they were being visited uh, by beings, um, and all human appearing, by the way, for many, many years, and every time they had lectures or things in their private property in Highbridge, New Jersey, there were always visitors there, 
and uh, in fact a part of their job when earlier visitors came, they called the ETs who came here, they would have to go and buy them earth clothes, right? So um, Okay, let me stop you real quick before you go on. Yeah. Do yeah. you know why that these extraterrestrials, uh, non-human beings, chose them? That well, they are no, they're they're human. They're not non-human. They're okay. human. But why did they're they? Choose they this? all look. They all look human. But their their um, their souls, like what we were talking about earlier, when people come on incarnation missions, what we were talking right. about, right? Right. Yeah, I misspoke myself. I apologize. There, there, uh, Howard and Connie are also from out there and came here on a mission, and that was part of their mission. Okay, that's what I wanted to get All to. Right. Who were these yes. people that the other ones were showing up at? Okay, okay. Correct, correct. So, so long, long story short, um, uh, Howard's passed away. I believe Connie is still alive. Um, and uh, as we know, Dr. Frank passed away in 2008. Yeah. Uh, I met him, I uh, believe, in late 2001, early 2002. Uh, I just thought I was going to have a nice little uh, lunch with him, and I was going to be the fan, right? And uh, we ended up becoming friends, and it was never my intention to um, make this into a... Uh, into a movie or anything like that. But as the course of time w uh, went over, um, it, that's uh, all of those things started to happen. And uh, anyway, so over the course of a few years, I, I wrote the script. But what I wanted to, what we originally had talked about, is if we go way back to the beginning in the 50s, where George Van Tassel ran Giant Rock Airport, he to uh, he was um, he had a visit from an extraterrestrial human being who landed at the airport because it's out in the middle of the desert. By the way, it's like a, a dirt airport. Uh, if anybody's been out to uh, the Yucca Valley, they they'll know what I'm talking about, or they can go to integratron.com, I-N-T-E-G-R-A-T-R-O-N.com. And this being, uh, whose name I believe was Salgonda, um, gave, gave George the blueprints to build the Integratron, which meant that George could walk 10,000 people through the bottom of it when it was turned on, and it would rejuvenate their cells and keep them looking young like the ET people stay looking young. They all look like they're a really good 30, even if they're 500 years old. So once they get to that certain mature age, they stop the aging process through, uh, through this, their technologies. Now, out there, out there in Universal Society, there's many, many ways that they all stay young, but it's usually done through resonance fields in their living environments. It can be done through their suits. It could be done uh, through many, many uh, ways and means. So, but getting back to uh, Van Tassel, so Van Tassel started having, um, he was the very first person to channel Ashtar, by the way. Okay. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. And um, I met many people who were out there in the early days. Some of them are still alive, so they've told me some great stories. And um, so his, his wife and uh, him, they lived underneath the rock. There was a guy who ran the airport before, uh, and there was a giant hole uh, under Giant Rock. It's the largest freestanding boulder on the planet. And, and the man lived underneath the rock. So that's where Joe, after, so after he vacated, George and his wife and family moved in and they lived under the rock, right? So there's pictures of this at the uh, Integratron.com as well. So, um, so George would have uh, UFO 
space conventions with all of the beings and people who were having um, uh, physical contact with human extraterrestrials who were coming here with messages of hope and messages of to stop the nuclear energy, um, messages of what they could do to help the world. And a lot of these people would come to these space conventions and they would give lectures and talks and they all wrote like little um, self-published books, which now I'm finding you can get on Amazon. People are finding them and putting them on Amazon, so, uh, which is really interesting. So Dr. Frank Stranges, who met with Valiant Thor in 59, used to be the MC of all the space conventions. Wow. Now, I didn't know this, so uh, um, the, there are uh, some sisters that own the Integratron, um, uh, Joanne and Nancy Carl, and they had called Dr. Frank to see if he wanted to be a part. They were going to be doing a retro space convention. So uh, Dr. Frank asked if I wanted to go out there with him, and I said, sure. Now, I, d I didn't know any of this information. We go out to the Yucca Valley. We have this incredible time. We're, we're, we're in the Integratron most of the day, just the four of us. And Dr. Frank starts telling us all the stories of yesteryear. So this is sort of where that space movement came from. And I think a lot of people, there is, there is a much larger story, which I am going to be telling in the feature film about Valiant Thor. Um, but I think the misconceptions are people think that because he's an ET from somewhere else, and he came and met with the evil U.S. government, right? <laughs> they take it and they twist it around and they say that he's, he's not, you know, he's not what you say he is. So I have never met Valiant Thor. Uh, you know, I always say that. Dr. Frank knew him his whole life and um, visited with him. I, I myself uh, had experiences with, um, with crew members. Uh, the first day I started writing the script, Valiant Thor came to me in a dream and showed me the whole path and everything. But you, you have to remember that he's a, uh, he's a created being. So he's an angelic and human form. And his mission was to come here and to help the people of the earth. Now, Eisenhower was not a corrupt president. Richard Milhouse Nixon was not a corrupt vice president at that time, right? So when they came, they both were for him coming to help the earth, but it was all the other powers that be that shut the plan down. So... So I think when people go into fear-based things, um, they tend to not believe the story. But what I always try to say is what Dr. Frank told everyone. It's, it's a big story to swallow all in one sitting. So if this is the first time you're listening to it, do a lot of research, get the facts, and, and that. Now... Can we, well, now, over the years, what proof is there? We have proof from Harley Bird, who is Richard E. Bird's uh, nephew, who was a part of Project Blue Book at that time, and he confirmed uh, the whole Valiant Thor story and that he was here to help the world. Now, uh, we, I have also obtained... Um, Harley Bird's honorable discharge papers from the Pentagon, proving that he was there in, working uh, under special investigations at the Pentagon during the years that Valiant Thor was there. And, um, and also uh, 
uh, receiving a uh, a letter um, from uh, that Admiral Richard E. Byrd wrote to a rear admiral at the Pentagon asking him to bring his son into the Pentagon, which was a year prior. I think it was written in 56, um, if I'm not mistaken. It could be 55, 56, uh, or early 57, I'd have to look, um, which then, of course, happened. So, so we, we do have that proof of the story. We have Dr. Frank's testimony. Um, we also have, I recently appeared on Ancient Aliens. They saw the short film that I did and did a whole story on Valiant Thor. Uh, they brought on the former Department of Defense, uh, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, onto the show, and he also confirmed the story on Ancient Aliens. Uh, that episode is called The Mysterious Nine. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, Laura Eisenhower, who is uh, President Eisenhower's great-great-granddaughter, corroborated the story as well. Um, since I've been making the film, I've had many people contact me, um, some saying that uh, they work for the Department of Defense and that the story is true. I can't prove that. Uh, that's, you know, it's all hearsay. Um, but... I, the one experience that I had, um, besides when I write, I get to feel who each one of them are. Because uh, just like when I was writing the uh, Tehran books, every single one of those beings in that book um, shared their feeling body with me. So sure, sure. I understood who they were on every cellular level to write about them. And, and when you start getting the angelics and that, you literally sit there and weep for quite some time because it's so beautiful. And it was the same experience I had when writing about Valiant Thor, especially, and then his vice commanders, which are Teal, uh, who's a woman, um, Thon, T-H-O-N-N, Dawn, D-O-N-N. Dawn is photographed with him uh, in those Menger pictures. And Zan, and then there's another created being from Melchizedek who is on board Victor One, and uh, his associate's name uh, is Yeo, Y-E-O, or Yo is what they call him uh, as well. So... So interestingly enough, the the, the crews uh, there's some permanent crew. Those are the permanent crew. There's other permanent crew, and then they shift out the crews between all the Victor class officers every three months. So everybody gets experience in all the different sections where they're stationed in and around the Earth. And then Dr. Frank talked about a giant starship that he visited a few times. Um, and uh, there has been another person who actually visited that starship um, that, that I've uh, heard their testimony as well. Um, but again, like, like I say, it's, it's hearsay. So I like to present the facts, but I also like to share with what other people shared with me. And if you feel it's right and true, then it's right and true for you. But the one, one thing that I had that really sealed it for me is early on, um, I, I became very sick, and I was in bed for about three days, and a, a really horrific stomach ache. And uh, I had to call uh, my best friend to rush me to the doctor. I, I finally couldn't take it anymore. Um, they tried doing everything, giving me stuff to if it would help me. Um, they decided to put me in an ambulance and rush me to the hospital. Um, I was uh, admitted into the hospital and uh, they did x-rays. They told me I had a bowel obstruction and they were going to have to operate on me in the morning. And I, uh, I was not too happy about that. So uh, my friend stayed with me till about 11 that night. I went to sleep and while I was sleeping, um, I could feel Teal standing over me, and I felt 
bubbles moving through all of my intestines. And I knew that when I woke up in the morning that everything would be okay. And that's, I was in a twilight when this was happening. I was half awake and half asleep. Right. And when I woke up in the morning, which um, I was remember being sort of on my side, and I looked over, and sitting in the chair was Dr. Frank. Oh. And I had no idea how he knew to come, because my friend was the only one that knew, right? And... He smiled and he said, Teal called me early this morning and wanted me to come and tell you that she fixed you up last night. Aw, what a great story. So that was my, yeah, so that was, the, so, you know, for me, that was a great story. I've not, you know, like I said, I've not met them in person, but I have met um, two other individuals who were on the planet who both met uh, Valiant Thor when they were um, in their teens. Uh, one met him twice in one week, and the other met him, uh, uh, met him uh, once. And their descriptions of him, and both these women do not know each other, by the way, um, and they're both lovely, incredible ladies, um, is that they both said what Dr. Frank said. When he looks at you, you know he's looking through you, and he knows every single thing about your soul, right? But they both said something that, that was interesting. They both said he had a scent about him that was like, a perfume, but wasn't a perfume, but it was an air of love and peace. Oh, and that was very telling. And one of them told me that she was very afraid that there was going to be a war with uh, Russia at that time. So that goes back into uh, the Cold War. In the Cold War, right? Um, but that he actually calmed her and said, don't worry, we are not going to let that happen. So it's interesting from listening to all of these things and knowing um, that there are beings that are, that are these incredible angelics that are looking after the planet, right? And if everybody believes in good and believes in, in the hierarchy, we know that there is an incredible angelic force and that that angelic force is actually looking after us. And, um, but if, if, uh, uh, but exactly Valiant Thor's mission could entail so much more than any of us could ever imagine, meaning, you know, they can't stop things that people do here, but they can help and assist in other ways you know it makes me wonder like when there was all the radiation and things did they help with calming that down are they helping with the chemtrails really what are chemtrails we've all heard a million different things about chemtrails um because you know they all have the technology up there uh the angelics and the ets and all of that is really all the same it's just all one class they're just all people just like us right uh, it really is how they want us to look at it and we're all the same some of us just might have a little more schooling than others like a valiant thor and that because if you think of the tiers of the hierarchy you would have to have an expanded brain to even understand consciousness beyond the consciousness that we understand here but even being fully conscious you'd have to understand the consciousness beyond being fully conscious and so on and so on so that's why we have all these different tiers that teach each other um about the universe wow that's really cool isn't it it is it's fascinating that's too, really it? really cool so well so and go ahead go ahead no you go well you go. Uh, i was going to ask if if you know, you said you have said in prior shows that your understanding is is that Victor One is still here, 
Uh, yes. It's it's camouflaged or stealth mode or invisible, whatever, however you want to word that. And sure. And that your understanding is, is that Valiant is still on the ship. I would be interested to know if if anyone is in recent contact with any of those beings that you were talking about, those humans that you were talking about, um, recently. Well, Dr. Frank passed in uh, November of 2008. And at that time um, and, and before, he told me that Valiant is here with his compliment and, um, amongst others as well. This is the main focus of the, of the enlightened universe is to bring this planet up to consciousness for it to join with universal society. So that's why there are so many things going on uh, here right now because it has to, has to go through its, its growing pains before that can happen. And for every, you know, so we know some people are awake, some people are asleep, and the ones that are asleep are the ones that we're all trying to help become more and more awake through doing their own spiritual work on themselves. And, um, uh, but Dr. Frank said that he is not leaving Earth until that transformation is complete, no matter how long it takes. And as we know, there are no timetables in the universe. It's just the amount of time that it needs for everybody here to feel comfortable and to feel safe. And we already know with all of the disclosure things going on and everything that people are really coming up to par. And I think people now really are in a space to start accepting that little by little and when they start to see that most you know there's a lot of different looking beings out there but you're you know people are going to come in contact with more human appearing and people will recognize that when they start to interact with these beings when when it, there is emerging um little by little um so let's just say let's just say disclosure happened right Okay. And some nice time passes. And some, some of these ambassadors come down. They're human. Um, they look just like us. They're not in camouflage. They're not little crazies in disguise. I mean, people go there. I don't know why they have to go there. But it's what you feel when you see them and sense them. And when you feel nothing but love, then you know that that's, what they're made of, right? So when they're here and, and then they start to share with you things, wouldn't, I would become a very welcome student to learn about the universe and all the things that are out there. I mean, I've my learned a lot. Right? My yeah, hand my is hand raised. Yeah, my hand is raised, too. Uh -oh. you know, uh -oh. I, I've learned a lot writing these books. Right. Um, which is, you know, fascinating. I mean, you know, just the spiritual technologies and the cool things. I mean, that's cool. But beyond that, you know, the, the tools that they have, um, like the imager, right? Like you can, through the imager, the imager can do everything. Make your food, create a larger space, create your clothes, you can also create a clone of yourself when you're having, when you are having a, uh, you're you're needing answers. So you can you through the imager you can create a clone of yourself and put your consciousness in it, and then talk to yourself outside yourself to see what you're missing. How about that? Isn't that cool? Yeah, that would, like, talk about a tool to, to teach oneself, yeah. eh? Yeah. It is. It is. It's a great tool, and they have that tool, and they're not afraid to use it because they're not afraid to look deep within and find out wherever the root of whatever 
uh, is doing. Because remember, even though you're fully conscious, you, you still are made of light and dark, but now your mind is working from love and uh, from the heart and not the mind. Ours here works from the mind and from the ego, and as we start working through all of our challenges and our spiritual things, that's as we start to start becoming closer to um, becoming fully conscious and merging our uh, merging our seven chakras, um, which bring in the Christ chakras. And I say Christ chakras, meaning not meaning religious, but meaning christened chakras that then come down and and that's when you start becoming fully conscious is when when you do that we we do have that integration and chakra charts in book three of um the the full 12 chakras and the um merged chakras uh as well in the books and in the hardcover of book three, on the back flap, um, there uh, the charts are there in color as well. Well, and I have to tell people if you if they haven't gotten the books, they really need to because first of all, is that all the all the characters, and, and I hate using that term because it makes it sound like it's totally you know fictional, and it's not um, that. Um, the characters are all represented. Uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful renderings, drawings, uh, all through the book. It's, it's just it's just fabulous. It's just it's just wonderful. So, um, yeah. So then yes. you can uh, you, your mind begins to kind of put it together, and it really brings everything to life. Literally, it's very fabulous. Yes, it does. So it does, it does, and uh, Christine Dennett did um, all the artwork, and uh, Kim Black did the Maram Iams, who are from the Great I Am. Uh, but Christine is the main artist who did everything, and uh, her artwork has evolved. I mean, they look like photographs in book three. Yeah, literal photographs now. So yeah. She's um, really done a beautiful yeah, job. Yeah, she's really, really, she's really good. And what's great about her is um, uh, she's connected into all of this because she's an experiencer and right. and she does. She's done this. A lot of her artwork is on a lot of the shows and uh, things that are on cable. A lot of the uh, stuff about extraterrestrials and things. So, um, so she's very connected into them. Well, and that's that makes it even even more so. Um, I don't know, uh, prominent when you're looking at them. I mean, you can, you, you know, if you're sensitive at all, you can really feel what's been put into them. It's not just a uh, two dimensional thing that she's done there. So it's really fabulous. Right. So yeah, a lot of a lot of people uh, say that they have wept looking at the photos because they. They miss home, and that yeah. was a representation. That it's such a representation of home. Yeah. Um, they got the the thing because with each you know each of these renderings, you know, it took us you know quite some time to just get the right energy signature so that people will actually feel who they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you did really. They everyone did really well. So yeah. back to who's on this planet. Yes. Besides those of us who were born on this planet, uh, at least in this incarnation, uh, who's all on this planet? Well, there's uh, there's all different kinds of scenarios. There's um, there's a lot of incarnated uh, beings from all over the universe, the super universe, other super universes. Um, they call in teams that have done this on worlds um, such as ours. Usually the worlds aren't as diverse as this one. Yeah. Um, so this one is, is quite the challenge. Um, and uh, because of a lot of other things that have happened here, because it's like the planet that's way off, you know, at the edge of the universe. Yeah, that's so, exactly right. And they've shown me uh, that. Yeah. 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 So 
so there's there i mean there's just so many races um uh that are incarnated um like for instance what's where well, here's an interesting uh thing to sort of go into the book like um out of melchizedek when the messengers are going into a planet to raise consciousness they will come in like let's say if they're coming to earth they will come into earth they will be um they will quicken their spirituality but they usually live short lives because let's say they came in and they were one nationality then they will come right back in and they will be a different nationality somewhere else and they will do the same exact thing and they usually will live somewhere from 20 to 30 they will go out and they will come back many 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 times so that they they understand and know every race and consciousness on the planet and when that when that whole um program has been fulfilled then they come in with a greater mission and become a mighty messenger and they'll come in with a specific task at hand to raise consciousness for the masses <coughs> Oh, well now that's that's uh that's an interesting yeah, that's yeah. an interesting take. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think so. if, I think if we look through our history books uh and really start and of course you know our our written history only goes back a certain point. There's way more history than what we're fully aware of on this planet, but even in our written history that which we can go back and follow, uh we can see that some of that has taken place. Uh, mm -hmm. for sure I mean you know yeah. there's yeah, yeah all over the globe I mean that's you know when you start looking at w when we start looking like even at the uh, archaeology digs and um, the the themes I'll use the word themes that go from continent to continent to continent to continent and the similarities in them which are the right. you know the artifacts that are left behind that we can actually see that there was a civilization there, et cetera, and so forth. Um, we can see that we can see that there's been something that has gone on that the message was the same or similar in all of these right. particular instances. And uh, yeah. I I always found that really really fascinating. It's like, well, okay, we got this here and that there and this here and that there. Well, these are really saying the same thing just in their different cultures and languages, you know, with yeah. obviously a little bit of a skew to it, obviously, because it has to fit in not only with the culture, but it also has to fit in with what was the time element, you know, what is the environment, um, you know, it's all subject to that as well. Right. And there, uh, I mean, we, we go back and we see that all these cultures had pyramids as well, a lot of these ancient cultures. They all had different types of uh, pyramids. They had the same messages. They had a lot of carvings mm -hmm. um, that had a, a saucer-type craft in them as well. Lots of cosmonaut uh, carvings. Um, all different types. I mean, they've dug up giant bones of giants that that uh, uh, have been on the planet. They, you know, uh, what was. Um, Stephen Greer's last movie with the little tiny alien body that they had that was like no bigger than a hand. Right. Um, there, there's so many different things, and we go back, and and then we have all these cultures, and then we have Egypt. Yeah. And you just look at Egypt, and you go, "Wow." Yeah. That's beyond comprehension and that, that these people were so advanced and and if we go back to the what was really in the library of alexandria of all the past history that was here that was lost in that fire did it have atlantis in it did it have yeah. what else was a what else was a part of that and then you'll have an anomaly here and there like akhenaten yeah who was the first to talk about one God, the or oneness, and was considered a complete rebel. Yep. So um, it's fascinating. And what did he look like? He looked like an extraterrestrial. 
So it's interesting. Uh, I, I would love, I, I wonder if there is history that we don't know that Egyptologists like uh, Dr. Howie Zawat uh, might know about origins of somebody like Akhenaten. Well, <clears throat> I can tell you, I was in Egypt in 2012. Uh, yeah. And uh, we went through uh, many of the pyramids and museums, and we were taken to sites that weren't, they were still doing digs on, um, that wasn't even open to the public. We were pretty fortunate with some of the things that we got to see. Uh, the museums, uh, a lot of them have since been looted, by the way. Um, uh. But they started with the oldest finds, and then they, you know, go into, you know, what's the most recent finds that, that they show to the public, by the way. Now, our guide was, um, he was a fabulous man, because even though uh, he was... Um, a tour guide they have by the way they have to go to a special college to become a tour guide over there um, you anybody in Egypt can go to college and it's free of charge and you can just choose whatever profession I guess that you want but you have to actually yeah. go to college to become a tour guide and they teach you all about this the history they teach the the tour guides all about the history well the history that they want the public to know and then there's the history that the public does not know and that's what's the most fascinating. And so sometimes, uh, you know, the, the students will get lucky and the teachers will share some information. But there was, there's all kinds of um, things that are not on the main drag of tourism uh, in Egypt that if you go, you, you find all these little mysteries and, and all of these other things that, that tie into it that aren't, aren't even being talked about and, and shown to the public. The public doesn't even know about it, but yet it is open to the public, but it's not on the same path as, you know, everybody wants to go right. to the Great Pyramids, right? So, and, right. and rightfully so. I mean, it's a very cool place to go, uh, to be sure. But there's also all these other places, and, and the um, information that I got when I was there, it was, it was the most spiritual journey for me. You know, like your Mount Shasta was for you. Over right. there, Egypt yeah. was, was mind-blowing for me. Uh, I, I had lucid experiences while I was there, while I was, in, you know, sp supposedly sleeping. I don't think I slept at all. Matter of fact, I ate very little and I was never hungry. I never lost weight. It was the weirdest experience ever that I huh. ever had. I was very odd. And uh, the things that were, um, the places that we would go to, I'd say, there's underground tunnels here, there's this, there's that, whatever. And now, of course, we find that there's more rooms in the pyramid that they didn't see before. Uh, that now that there's all these tunnels underneath and all this other stuff, there was all these things that I was being shown, and it, it come from all these various races that were there, um, places that we saw that were uh, had been filled in with cement because they didn't want the public in it. I mean, there's just so much that 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 haven't even been excavated yet. I mean, wow. the, it, so the history there is not even, I don't even think it's 20% known. What all yeah. really resides there. Right. I, I don't think either. And I'm sure that there are time capsules oh. uh, there that are waiting to be opened at certain intervals uh, that will release amazing information about the planet. Oh, and it's everywhere. You talked about the pyramids. Yeah. You know, there's pyramids in China and Japan and uh, South America and Africa, here in the United States, uh, everywhere. There are pyramids all across the world. Um, some of them are not being allowed to be in. I know there was some pyramids that they found in Ecuador um, that they weren't. It was either Ecuador or Peru. I believe it was Ecuador, but they they don't even allow anybody to go in them. They're they're just off limits. Nobody can go in them. Australia same wow. way. Um, uh, places over in the Middle East, um, they're all blocked off um, by the military. The military doesn't let anybody in. So they they've they found these ancient sites. Uh, governments have or people have discovered them, and the governments found out, and then they shut them down, just like the Grand Canyon. There's points here in the United States we're not even allowed to go into the Grand Canyon. 
you know there's stuff there that, that right was, it's, they're probably the entrance to, to the inner earth I'm sure uh, yeah and to a lot of information that I believe that we as the race of humans on this planet deserve to know about right and I think right. we will Yes, we definitely will. We definitely will. I mean, all that stuff comes out in in the time that the that the planet will will need it and be able to accept it. That's so, right. The Elohim call it uh, the great revealing. The great revealing, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's also fun is in um, book two is Pyramid City at Melchizedek, mm. uh, which is a giant pyramid city. And uh, this is where a lot of things take place uh, with the messengers, mighty messengers, the universal hierarchy, um, all that. And there's even a nice, uh, Christy did a gorgeous artist rendering of uh, the Pyramid City as well. Could you imagine going into a gigantic city like that? I mean, there are gold, silver, bronze, yeah. crystal waterways in between it, um, gorgeous, uh, you know, beautiful flowers and uh, shrubs and all kinds of things. I mean, it's, it's a fantastical place. I, uh, this would be, I, I would really love to see these books made into movies just to see all these landscapes. Come Wouldn't that just be awesome? Stuff. Yeah. yeah. Really and truly would. All so. the colors and the vibrancy and, oh. Yeah. Just amazing. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be really, really amazing. Yeah, absolutely. So, so yeah. the other thing that you wanted to get into tonight before we run out of time here was you wanted to talk about the consciousness raising programs. You know, yeah. our world is really crazy right now. Um, it's getting crazier by the moment. And we can either get caught up in the craziness or we can do right. something different, which is to step out of the craziness. It doesn't change the craziness from going on, but you are not contributing to the craziness by being involved in it, you know, in a personal level like that. That's right. And That's right. So, so you're, yeah. So this whole consciousness raising thing that you programs that you want to talk about, I think is might help to redirect people and give them something else to focus on. It, that's absolutely true. I was just talking to a friend of mine uh, the other day about a lot of uh, star seeds or, or people who know that they're not from here are getting so caught up in the negative part that, that some of them um, uh, are uh, get into uh, drugs or they get into alcohol or they become chain smokers because they don't know how to direct all of this energy coming in, right? And I, and that's not true for everybody, but I'm just giving some hypotheticals and, and stuff. So when, when I had my spiritual awakening, I myself had to learn to, over all these years, go in. First of all, I had to learn how to ground myself. I meditated every day. I stopped watching the news. I stopped participating in anything that would lend a negative vibration. And that included friends right. as well. So I would, um, uh, uh, so I would have talks with friends if they were, if, if they were living in this horrifically negative world, I would just say to them, you can't just call me and keep dumping on me every day because you're having an angry day and your anger happens almost every day. So what you're doing is you're spreading it into me and then I take on that anger and then I have to process it. So I don't go out in the world and make somebody else angry because I'm angry right? and I don't even know why I'm angry. So it's like a virus. So, it is a virus. Anyway, it is a virus. So I've, I, I had uh, one, one particular friend in particular, uh, I would say, so don't call me unless you have something good to say. So it was like a month. It was like a month before he called me. He said, 
He said, see, haven't I been good? <laughs> oh, that's cute. That's I haven't cute. called you in a month because I've been in a bad mood. <laughs> but anyway, the thing is, is that even over the years, even though he didn't understand a lot of things that I was talking about, he now does, and he understands it. Uh, and it's just, it's just retraining your emotions to not be reactive. And when you become reactive is when you start setting in motion a chain of anger and misunderstandings and uh, everything that goes along with that with the people that you're either working with, the people that you love, uh, or, uh, and your, your friends as, uh, as well. Um, because when you focus on you and you focus on your own spiritual nature, you are actually raising the vibrations around you and you are helping to lift up those that are around you by just being who you are. And if you're having a difficult time with someone, my very first thing was I, I back then, because I didn't know quite what to do, I, was, I, I went to a metaphysical counselor, and she told me to put the person I was having these difficulties with, it was a coworker, in a ball of gold light and send them love. And I was like, never going to happen. Right, <laughs> never going to happen. But then I just went, okay, well, I'll try this. And so I did it, and it was difficult. And then I did it again the next day, and then it started getting easier and easier as the days went by. And I noticed that things started to sort of ease up. And I was like, oh. There's something to if this. It's too difficult to talk to somebody face-to-face -face at first, talk to their soul first and allow some time to pass. And when you feel it's ready, you can smooth things out. It doesn't mean you have to be their best friend, no. but at least whatever needed to be worked out was your lesson. And in that lesson, you just learned something, you moved through it, and now you go to the next tier. And you keep going up in these tiers as, as you get them. So. I always looked at every challenge in life as a spiritual lesson and how am I going to get through it. And I've had some really, really great challenges. I mean, really, really. I work in the film business, remember. Yeah, <laughs> so, and it's, it's a challenging uh, yes. business. Very cutthroat. Yes, I mean, be. really, really, really challenging. And um, so... That's, that's what I do, and, and Teal said something um, to Dr. Frank, too, once, which, which also stuck with me, is somebody was asking um, about what, what they should do, and what they were is they were putting all their busy business on everybody else, trying to help fix everybody else, and Teal said, you're here on planet Earth to learn about you, and you should be focusing on yourself and your spiritual growth and not others. So now, does that mean then you, say, then, you, then you can stop and say, yeah, but I care, and that's somebody that I love, and blah, blah, blah. So really what you can say to that person is, I'm here for you if you need me. Give me a call. Instead of trying to fix them. Well, you should do this, and you should do that. And we all know what happens when you give advice to people. Has anybody ever taken it in your family? Never. Yeah, right, exactly. So it's best to let people be and to do what you're going to do, uh, which is going to raise who you are and do that. And I will say, way in my early days, in the, um, in the, especially in the 80s, I would have giant spiritual parties where we would do meditations and talk about experiences. And a lot of these people were in the film business. And, and one of them uh, is a very huge person in the film business now. And, and uh, oh, maybe 10 years ago, we had a giant surprise birthday party for her. 
uh, where every huge agent, manager, and casting director in town was there. There was about 50 people. And um, she got up and uh, was, she came in and was totally surprised. She started talking just to thank everybody, and she started walking. I was towards the end of this giant long table. And she walked over to me, and she stood me up, and she started crying. And she said, I just want to thank this man because this is the man that gave me my spirituality. I didn't know that. But just from her coming and being around is what made her look deeper into herself. And I just looked at that as such a great tribute to just being who you are and doing what you're doing and affecting people but not even knowing that you're affecting people. That's right. That's right. And you never know. Right, And that's what it's about. And yeah. that's what it's about. Leaving the world a better place in which you found it and the people around that's you. Right. And, that's yeah. right. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Agreed. Absolutely. Yeah. Beautiful. So, yeah. So, so it's gorgeous. So in other words, in, in the consciousness raising is if you identified with being a star seed, an indigo blue, a messenger, a mighty messenger, or just somebody visiting planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> You want to raise your consciousness because each planet is a school, mm -hmm. and this school is teaching duality. And we, to ascend into the grandeur of the universe, we will be going from planet to planet. So when we leave here, we go into the hub, which is Melchizedek, which is 490 planets from one end of the galaxy to the other. They're called university planets. And um, Tehran teaches on University Planet 22 and 23. And um, it's, it's, you, you will go there and then you will, you will say, what does my soul want to learn now? Do I want to learn more about the science of the universe? And if you do, then you will then next go and incarnate on a scientific planet and learn more about science. And each of these worlds in um, universal society, depending on the world, so let's say one world is scientific, one world is about unconditional love, one world's a little bit of both, um, one world's uh, about learning about the different species throughout all the universes and super universes. Each like like here we have a lifespan of anywhere like the normal lifespan is anywhere from 60 to 80 somewhere in the 80s right is the normal lifespan so that's what we think we need to maybe get it but here we can come in many times because there's so many different things to learn through all the different cultures which is an incredible blessing in disguise by the way and um, because we learn, we learn the circuitry of different types of consciousness. And that circuitry is done because each set of consciousness is its own. And what, what they believe and what they think and, and, uh, and the things that they create. You know, I was having sushi with a friend of mine last night, and she said, I just want to thank the Japanese people for creating sushi. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good. I mean, I love sushi. So, um, but, but then, uh, so, so let's say maybe on one planet, the allotted lifespan for the beings there to learn what they need to learn is a thousand years, two thousand years, five thousand years. So then, whatever it is, that's the general lifespan of those beings, and they will stay looking thirty because they have the resonation fields to keep them looking that way. So, um, so it's all extremely. Um, it's all the whole universe works in the favor of us as long as we join the flow of the universe and let it and work with it. Then we become at one and learn everything that we need to learn. And and really here is just we all know is just letting letting go of the ego. And once we learn to let go of the ego and allow things to be, 
then we understand the greater the gr- I think we understand love on a much deeper level. I I just went through a second um spiritual awakening. Didn't know you could have two. So I guess you could have three and four and five. But this one was really getting deeper into the understanding and feeling of unconditional love. And um it was really um it was challenging getting through it, but I knew not to fear all the experiences and move through it so I could get through it quicker. Because the quicker you get through it, then you don't have to live in it that long. And then it becomes a part of your makeup till you get to the next till you get to the next part. Absolutely. So. Well, and you know, I always said our DNA holds everything that we've ever been Yep. Um, yep. And and when we learn how to access that, uh, yep, we've we've got a lot going for us. Well, it looks like we're we're just about out of time here. So what I would love for you to do, I this has just been great. We have covered uh, a I gamut of things, Craig, for people. Uh, I hope they go back in and listen to it again, even if they listen to it the first time, because there was a lot of layers to this show today. Um, yeah, a- extremely um, inform- informative for sure. Uh, but if you would, before we go, I, I would love for you to uh, give out your web addresses, how people can get a hold of you, whatever information you'd like to leave everyone with tonight. Sure. Uh, the uh, Autobiography of an Extraterrestrial Saga, the uh, book website for the trilogy is autobiography of un, A-N-E-T dot com. Uh, just click on books and you can order them individually in hard or soft cover or we have a super fan special where you can get all three books um, in hard cover or soft cover and I personalize them and autograph them at no extra charge of course. Uh, the super van special, you can get some extra goodies, and anybody who buys a book, we give you a secret code to get in to uh, see the color pictures of a lot of the lead characters, of course, including Tehran, um, and read their bios as well. Uh, if anybody wants to see the short film Stranger at the Pentagon uh, or learn more about the short film and the feature film, which I am now uh, starting to raise the money for and gearing up for that, uh, just go to StrangerAtThePentagon.com and you can see, if you toggle through the pages, you'll see the most famous photograph of uh, Valiant Thor. Uh, and uh, what Dr. Frank looked like back in the day when he met Valiant Thor, and uh, learn a lot of the uh, fun accolades that we've gotten um, on the short film uh, uh, throughout the years um, since uh, since uh, we won the Burbank Film Festival and the Houston uh, World Fest Film Festival for Best Sci-Fi Short. So... Um, and then if anybody's interested in learning about uh, my uh, casting career, which has been over three decades, um, just go to craigcampobasso.com and see uh, a lot of the movies that I've worked on over the years and see some of the trailers. Uh, by the way, if anybody's a Bashar fan, I cast uh, the uh, Bashar First Contact, which uh, is just out now. So... Um, uh, so you can see the trailer for that there as well. And James Woods narrated uh, the movie. Isn't that cool? Oh, wow. And so the movie's out now. Is it in theaters it or what? It is. It's, it's, uh, I think they're having screenings. I think if you go to uh, Bashar's website, I'm not sure if it's Bashar.com or .org, but if you type in Daryl Anka with two R's, A-N-K-A, uh, Bashar, it will definitely come up. I know he's in Prague, I think, right now, screening the film over there. Uh, we already had uh, several screenings here. Um, and I know he'll be back doing some Bashar channelings here in Los Angeles, I believe, in late November or early December. It's all on the website. So um, that was very fun doing that film. So. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. He's a nice guy. He, he, I had yeah, him on the show once. Guy. He was, uh, uh, it was pretty fun. It was back in the day. So, well, yeah, that's all yeah. like, really exciting. And I'll tell you what, this has just been a really great show. Um, obviously, you've got some new things that are going to be coming forward. So I hope you uh, keep in contact. We're going to get you back on the air uh, probably next year. Well, it sounds like it's a long oh, time away. Oh, that would be awesome. Sure. <laughs> but Love it's to. not just a few months away. So um, yeah. you'll have to keep me updated so that I can keep everybody else updated as well. As always, it's, yes. just, it's absolutely just lovely to have you on, uh, Craig. It's always just such a treat. I love it. I, I love talking to you. You're so open and so honest and so real. I just love, always love that about you, and I really enjoy uh, talking to you as well. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. <laughs> and I appreciate everyone out there listening. And so I'll leave you with, until we meet again, where will your life's journey lead you? Many blessings, everyone, and good night. Blessings. Good night.